Alan's education was at the University of Texas and the University of Colorado in Boulder. He, as director of the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, he built that organization into one of the leading planetary science organizations in the US. He has, I think he's been the PI on something, the principal investigator on something like 20 spacecraft missions or instruments, and of course his topic tonight deals with his PI role on the New Frontiers mission. Finally, I would point out that about three years ago, Alan left all of this, all of the science, all of the mission activity, and agreed to go to Washington to take the lead role in NASA, the Associate Administrator for Science, the top science position in the agency. We scientists were delighted. We figured if there was anybody that could shake up the system and make things happen and really make sure science was represented at NASA headquarters, it was Alan. He did all that, and then after a year quit, uh, which may say more about NASA headquarters than it does about Alan. Uh, he's now back at the Southwest Research Institute. He's also involved in the private enterprise side, in people competing for the X Prize to send spacecraft to the moon. And for our purposes, most important, he is the leader of the New Frontiers mission to Pluto and beyond. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Alan Stern and ask you all please to welcome him for this talk. Okay, so hopefully the mic's up and working. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction and thank you for the SETI Institute for having me here this evening. It's nice to be back. Uh, it's particularly nice that uh, the director of the Carl Sagan uh, Center here uh, introduced me because Carl Sagan was, although not a mentor, uh, certainly an inspiration for me when I was a kid uh, growing up and wanting to go into science. Um, I was a little bit worried before David's introduction because uh, first thing Adrian did was tell everybody where the exits are. <laughs> so it's a little bit worrisome as a speaker. I'm gonna tell you tonight about um, New Horizons uh, NASA's mission to Pluto in the Kuiper Belt, um, and I know uh, enough about it that you can, you can ask me any question, almost any one of you uh, can ask me uh, almost anything about the, this mission, the science, the rationale, the politics, how we got to do it, anything, and I can probably answer it without having to bluff. But um, last week, something else happened to me. Um, I was uh, giving a talk, in fact, the first time I'd given an invited talk at a, um, a forum on commercial human spaceflight, which is something I'm very interested in, but I'm a little bit new to, and I was very humbled by being in, in a room with people like the ex-program manager of the shuttle and people that run Virgin Galactic and so forth and so on. And so um, I got my little 15 minutes to talk, and as soon as I finished, the first question from the guy in the front row was Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> this actually relates to tonight's talk. And, and Buzz um, actually didn't have a question, he had a speech to make. <laughs> and and my, my talk had been about um, training for payload specialists, scientists to fly on suborbital missions. And uh, Buzz went on a harangue about what the term astronaut means and what tourist means and what passenger means and should scientists and tourists really get the stature of being called astronaut and I don't care, right? <laughs> but Buzz is going on and on and the room is getting really quiet and everybody's looking at me because Buzz ends by saying, and what do you think? <laughs> And here's what I told him. I said, this is exactly what I told him. I said, because um, I did not want to answer that question. So I said, you know, Buzz, I'm trained as a planetary scientist. In my field, we can't even agree what a planet is. So I am not, I am not going near the astronaut thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here to tell you about New Horizons. Um, and uh, I was asked to, to uh, flesh the talk out a little bit, talk a little bit about myself. And so um, well, I'm going to talk about myself at first, which is not always comfortable for a scientist. But uh, for those of you who uh, may have an ambition to go into science, whether as a career or as a hobby or you have a, a child or grandchild that's interested in science, I know for a lot of us that are in science, it's a labor of love and it's something that many of us got the bug very early. 
I said I would talk about myself. There we go. <laughs> so here we go with my first microscope. Um, in 1960, we don't want to talk about it when, um, during the Mad Men era. Uh, and uh, as I said, my interest started very early. I always knew what I wanted to do. Um, I remember being scolded many times by teachers who said, you should broaden your horizons. You should think about other things. Don't you really want to be a fireman or something else? I didn't, but it launched a great career, um, and the things that I've gotten to do, I would never have believed when I went to undergraduate and graduate school. Um, among them, fly high-performance jets out of Edwards Air Force Base for a few years, doing science missions, more recently training for suborbital missions that um, David alluded to. Um, I got a lot of time to do teaching, um, a lot of time to do public speaking, uh, and um, uh, as David said, um, have been involved in uh, uh, leadership and management of space missions uh, for the last 15 years or a little bit more. Uh, of those, New Horizons is my absolute favorite. It is larger than life. We are going back to the days of exploration. We're going to the farthest reaches on the frontier of our solar system with the fastest spacecraft ever launched, with the most sophisticated payload ever sent on a first encounter to a whole new type of planet. And if you go see Mike Brown's talk tomorrow night, you just tell him that Alan Stern told him, told you, Pluto's a planet, and he, need, he needs to get over it, and his book. <laughs> and it's better than that. And then I want you to ask him a question at the end. Ask him how his book isn't selling very well. <laughs> so here's what we're doing. This is an overview of New Horizons, then I'm going to give you more details. We launched in January of 2006, on January the 19th. So in fact, the day after tomorrow is the fifth anniversary of our launch to the day. Uh, we flew by Jupiter in 13 months, uh, really very fast. You know, it took Galileo, the Galileo orbiter, four plus years to get to Jupiter. Uh, it took Cassini six years to get to Jupiter. We did it in 13 months flat. Um, did a gravity assist flyby. We're not passing anything else on the way. We will arrive at Pluto four and a half years from now in July of 2015. And then we will go on beyond Pluto to make flybys of small Kuiper Belt objects as we exit the solar system, or at least the planetary region. Um, we are, as I said, we launched five years ago. That's over 1,800 days ago. There are very few NASA missions that actually run this long, uh, much less to get to their first target. We spend nine and a half years. So this mission is all about delayed gratification <laughs> in many respects. Um, we are currently, and I have a pointer, so I'll show you. We are there, almost at the orbit of Uranus, right there, just about to kiss the orbit of Uranus. Uranus is nowhere near close. It's, it's around up here. But um, uh, if you're watching in March, um, when the Met NASA Messenger mission enters orbit around Mercury on the 18th, that'll make the news. It'll be all over the news. What won't be on the news is that same day, on the 18th of March, we cross the orbit of Uranus. And then we will cross the orbit of Neptune on the 25th of August, 2014. 25 years and one day after Voyager 2 explored Neptune. And then Pluto the very next year. Um, and the spacecraft's in very, very good health. And the project team is in very, very good health, which is important on a long mission. <laughs> and uh, this is the only little bit of politics I have in this whole talk. Everything I'm going to tell you about is something that I'm very proud of that only the United States can do. There is no other nation on Earth that has had the capability and the will to explore the outer solar system. We are the only ones that can do that. And I'm very proud of that. It's not just a sign of, of our technological prowess, but also I think of what really what a great nation we really are. And I know that Carl Sagan said many things in the same context about our ability to explore the inner planets in the 1960s and 70s. And to be able to be a part, much less to be a leader, of an expedition to the farthest of the planets and to this whole new class of planets on the very frontier of our knowledge is you just got to pinch yourself every single day as to how lucky you are to get to be involved in something like that. So let me tell you a little bit about New Horizons. And let me start by saying uh, the idea for this began in 1989 with a very small group of young scientists one of them, at least, is in the room. I saw Fran Baganel sitting over here. Fran would raise her hand, maybe stand up. Fran was at the very beginning of this when we just asked, because Voyager was going by the Neptune system. 
and wasn't going anywhere near Pluto, well, why can't we get a mission to Pluto? So I think Fran bucked me up or something, and I went and saw the fellow. Hmm? I bucked you up? Okay. But I remember going to see this guy, Jeff Briggs. Some of you may know him because he was later out here, um, who was running the planetary program. And I went into his office at NASA headquarters and said, why don't we have a mission to Pluto? And he said, well, probably because nobody's ever asked me to do that before. We, we ought to study that. And I thought, well, that, that was easy. <laughs> we, sh we should be there any time now. <laughs> Little did I know how involved it would be because we had to raise a lot of money, a better part of a billion dollars. Now, how do you get to do it? At the time, back in 1990, the post, the post office was publishing a set of stamps commemorating the first mission to every single planet, Mariner 10 to Mercury, and Mariner 4 to Mars, and Mariner 2 to Venus. And this is the only lousy thing they could come up with for planet number nine, <laughs> is not yet explored, right? Well, this is not how you get a mission that, that costs the better part of a billion dollars, <laughs> because neither the scientific community nor NASA can throw the better part of a billion dollars at a place just because you haven't been there before. Think of how many asteroids and comets and Kuiper Belt objects um, we have not been to. You have to have better rationale than that. Now, there are other ways to get a mission, and today we have commercial space flight, but this is not how we got to do New Horizons. <laughs> we thought about it. Some of those products sell pretty well. It's not how we did it. We had to do it this way. This is a map, a sketch map, sort of, of Washington, D.C. You know, like the guy said, why do you break into banks? Because that's where the money is, right? Why do you go to Washington, D.C.? Same reason. And we had to enter this maze. And with France leadership and the help of many people starting in 1989, we got ourselves in this, inside this beltway uh, uh, in a circuitous maze that resulted in five different Pluto mission studies, none of which ever got out of the paper stage, all of which got canceled for one reason or another. And we worked on it really hard. And finally there came a day in two, the year 2000 where the mission had progressed so far that instruments had already been selected science team had already been selected but not yet announced. And the fellow that was running space science at the time uh, at NASA headquarters canceled the whole thing because the price had gotten out of control, which I applaud, by the way. But after four, uh, however many years that had been, 11 years, our hopes were dashed. But we actually managed to rally both the scientific community and the public to get this done. And within just a matter of months, NASA reversed its course and listened to the scientific community and the public and put out a call for proposals uh, for anybody off the street, any team to form and have a competition for missions to Pluto. It took us 14 years in the end, but we ended up uh, with the money to implement this. And so I have a little message, and some of you <laughs> know about this, about ground down pencils and so forth. Uh, for, we picked ourselves up off the floor six different times five different cancellations, and we never quit. And, and uh, I think it's very important in life that you teach your children and you teach your grandchildren that um, it doesn't matter how smart your team is, it doesn't matter what connections you may have, it doesn't matter if you're living at the right time. When adversity comes, what really matters is those people who pick themselves back off the floor and try again, and sometimes have to try again and again and again. And that's what it took. It took people like Fran Bagenal who were not willing to take no for an answer, no matter how many times it was delivered when they really believed in it. But that's not actually all that it took. We actually had to have a good scientific rationale. And there were many scientific rationales to fly a mission to Pluto that um, you could tell to the National Academy. You know, it's a double planet. We'd never been to a double planet. It has a hydrodynamically escaping atmosphere like the early Earth, and it was a laboratory for studying some of the important physical processes in the early Earth's atmosphere. It had a very complex surface composition and complicated seasons and was sort of a uh, cosmochemist's wonderland. Uh, we had other reasons to be interested, but most important, I think, in the end, what really sold it in the early 2000s was the fact that we discovered the Kuiper Belt in the 1990s. And as we started to learn more and more about this third zone of the solar system beyond the terrestrial planets and beyond the giant planets, that we started to realize the importance of Pluto and its cohort. Um, this, this, this chart deserves a little bit of attention, so let me walk through it slowly. In the lower left, you see a little sketch map of the orbits of the planets, the way that you were taught about them in your grade school. There are four 
interterrestrial planets. They're so squinched in by the sun that they have to do a little pop-up, zoom-up for you to be able to see them. Then four circular orbits of the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and then um, strange Pluto in an odd egg-shaped orbit with a much smaller mass than either the terrestrial planets or the giant planets. And that was our old view of the solar system. Um, from the time that Cl Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto in 1930 until the 1990s when technology allowed us to find out that there were many things like Pluto in the outer solar system. We really had this very odd view that there was this one misfit, Pluto, because our technology limited us from seeing more of them. And if you looked at a map of the solar system arranged this way on a log-log chart so that you have mass running up in factors of 10 on the ordinate, and then distance running in factors of 10 along the abscissa. There's a nice grouping around one Earth mass and one Earth distance for the four terrestrial planets. So they're related somehow. They're in a clump. The giant planets look like a clump. And then there was this misfit, Pluto, on the outside. But in 1992, the first Kuiper Belt object was discovered. In 1993, four more were found. In 1994, the number was up to about 16. Today, we know of over 1,200, I think, on the list. And we know that we've only surveyed about 1% of the sky. All of our little fields where we take the photographs only add up to a tiny fraction. This is an enormous population in the outer solar system. It's the largest structure, by the way, in the planetary system, the Kuiper Belt. This is a view of the solar system looking down on it from above that yellow dot, the sun. And all those blue dots are um, asteroids that orbit with Jupiter, called Trojan asteroids. All the red and white dots are objects in the Kuiper Belt. You can see it's really a belt beyond the orbit of Neptune. There's a hole there, not because there's a hole in the Kuiper belt, but that's a direction that astronomers don't like to look in because it's too hard. It's towards the galactic center. So too many stars there. Um, and so um, this, is, this is just an observational artifact. And if you notice that there might be things that look like structures, little radial structures like fingers, those aren't really real radial structures either in the Kuiper belt. That's just that when you have an observing run and you look along one direction and you discover six or seven objects spread out in distance, it gives you the impression that there's a little string of them in a row. It's just the ones you found that night or that week. Okay? But the, one of the surprising things about the Kuiper belt is that it's littered with small planets. It's not just that we have things the sizes of asteroids, 50 kilometers and 100 or 200 kilometers across, but big guys that are 1 and 2,000 kilometers across. And in fact, these are all um, real objects in the Kuiper Belt, some of, which, some of them have real names like Sedna and Pluto. Um, this one is now called Eris, and it's not much bigger than Pluto, as you may have recently heard. In fact, it's probably either the size of Pluto or slightly smaller. Um, these are their real colors when we know their colors. Some are pink and some are gray. Some are just sort of uh, neutrally reflecting ice balls. Some of them have satellites, little ones or big ones. Um, this is a huge revolution from what we knew when I was a kid, and I think most of you were a kid growing up. Don't think of the solar system as four terrestrial planets and four giant planets and a misfit, but four terrestrial planets, four giant planets, and something like a thousand of the dwarf planets. So who's crying now, right? <laughs> right? What's the dominant class of planet in the solar system? It's the dwarf planets that we didn't know a thing about except for oddball Pluto until 1992. Right? It's really a revolution. I like to say to ch school kids so they can remember it, don't think of nine, think more like 900. Okay? And this is upsetting to some people. Even some Caltech professors can't deal with the fact that there are too many planets to remember their names. Okay, we need to get over that. Fortunately, there was no IAU in 1610 when Galileo figured out there were too many stars to remember all their names, pointed the telescope in the sky, right? And we don't care that there are too many rivers on Earth to have to memorize all their names or mountains or whatever. In fact, I remember what I was taught about rivers as a school kid. What, all you had to know were three things. You had to know the names of the seven biggest rivers, that there were an unimaginable number of other rivers, and the n names of the rivers near where we grew up. In, in my town, it was uh, the Mississippi River um, near New Orleans. But um, that's probably what school kids of the 21st century will learn about the planets. That the solar system is really good at making planets, mostly little ones. That the Earth is once again displaced from the center of the universe. Carl would have been very proud of that, I think. And, and that you don't have to know the names of all of them. 
you only have to know that there are a lot, and maybe the names of the famous ones. The first ones that we knew about, for example, the biggest ones, um, the ones that we sent spacecraft to explore where we have uh, really good data sets. And you know, in the rest of astronomy, we don't care that there's a big range of sizes among objects. These are some stars. Um, maybe you know the names of these of some of your astronomers, like uh, these supergiants like Antares and Betelgeuse, and giants like Aldebaran and Rigel. And if you look really hard, there's a little dot of a dwarf star, still a star. It's called the sun. It's really hard to see down there. We have a similar situation now with planets. It's quite analogous. Um, now, I'll stop here on my soapbox about what's a planet and what's not, but I'd be really happy to take any questions at the end if you want to talk about that and bone up before you go see Mike talk in a night or two. Um, I'm going to go back. I just want to stress one thing if I can get the right slide, I hope, there, is that these objects like Pluto, shown here to scale with the, all the asteroids that we've ever had flybys, those little fly specks in there, these are very large objects by any human standard. Pluto's surface area is like North America. Okay? So when, you think, when somebody holds up a marble and says it's a dwarf planet, it's not really a planet, it has an atmosphere, it has multiple moons, it has a core, it has polar caps, seasons. We can go right on down the list. Every attribute that other planets have, except it's smaller. So just like a chihuahua is still a dog, <laughs> dwarf planets are planets too. And because of that discovery of the largest structure in the planetary system, coupled with the fact, the realization, that the solar system made this whole new class of objects we didn't have any experience with after 40 years of planetary exploration. In the last decadal survey, not the one that's just finishing up now, but the one about 10 years ago, this mission to go explore Pluto and the Kuiper Belt rose to the very top of the heap. And NASA had challenged us that to get the money, we had to not be in the A-list, but at the top of the A-list. And you know, the good news in that was that after the scientific community ranked this as the number one priority, for a medium scale mission, that the system really worked. NASA, which had been opposed to doing a Pluto mission, put it forth, and Congress and the administration actually followed up on it, and we finally got that money 14 years after Fran and I and a few other friends started in 1989. In 2003, we got the authorization to actually turn designs into metal and circuit boards and all of that, and off we went. Uh, now, in 2001, our team, New Horizons, had proposed this mission in this nationwide competition that I talked to you about. And um, our team happened to come out on top. And um, as a result, we were selected to put it in design phase, but we still hadn't got the money. Um, actually, the list of people on the science team is here, but the number of people that got involved by the time we built it was in the thousands. I'm not exaggerating. Including the launch vehicle, at one point, 2,500 people were working on New Horizons at once. That's not exactly what you learn to do in graduate school, manage a project like that. But fortunately, we had two very talented project managers, Tom Coughlin at the beginning at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and Glenn Fountain, who's actually here in the room somewhere. Where did Glenn move to? There's our project manager, Glenn Fountain, who's been with us ever since we were still in paper stage and just decided not to retire until we get to Pluto. And then uh, I also wanted to point out because we're here in the Bay Area, that quite a, number, quite a fraction of the science team comes from either NASA Ames or Stanford or other institutes in the area. Those names in green are all local to you. That's probably about 20% of our nationwide science team. That's the cover of our proposal. We were selected on 29th of November 2001 to get started. Um, we were then promptly canceled the 1st of February by the incoming Bush administration because the Pluto mission was over budget. We hadn't even had a contract yet. But again, it was persistence. We picked ourselves up. We explained the story. That was the one that was canceled last year. You didn't really mean it with us, right? And just then the decadal survey was coming out and ranked it very highly, and we got a chance to build it as a result. NASA had given us some requirements, basically a list of what you must do and should do. And I would like you to know the three top things that we have to do at Pluto, that we're contractually bound to do. We have to map Pluto and its moons with cameras. And there are plenty of specifications for signal to noise and dynamic range and resolution and phase angles and all kinds of things. And colors, number of color bands. But also, we had to map their compositions, 
So at every location, at some specified resolution and signal noise and sensitivity, we have to be able to establish a spectrum so we can tell what every spot is made of across Pluto and its moons. And we had to characterize the structure and composition of the atmosphere and measure its escape rate. So that's like a three-legged stool. You must do all three. You can't pick any two out of the three or the stool will tip over. And you had to prove your ability of your spacecraft, your team, your mission operations concept, the instruments, everything to carry that suite of investigations out. And then NASA said, um, if you would, try to accomplish these important but not mandatory requirements that are listed. I won't read them. And by the way, if you have a chance, there's some others that are sort of lower down the list that are desired. Get as many of those in as you can, but you must do this within budget. Okay. Now, the mission that we designed, believe it or not, which is actually costing about 20 cents in the dollar compared to Voyager, accomplishes every single item on this list except for one, which is a search for magnetic fields that's way down here in the group threes that we elected not to do. Um, and so when we get to Pluto, we will carry out every one of these investigations with our instruments. And we will do it not just at Pluto and its giant moon, the double planet moon Charon, um, that was discovered in 1978, but also at the two smaller moons that we discovered in 2005, Nix and Hydra, uh, that orbit farther out beyond. So we have four objects, and we'll be doing all that mapping, all that color and black and white and high resolution and low resolution phase angle studies, composition, measuring their temperatures, all that stuff. And we'll search for any more moons or rings or what have you that we haven't yet found that are there in the system. So once we won it, we got to build it. And so we went from proposal to spacecraft. That's our actual New Horizons spacecraft with the big um, dish antenna. Um, and here's the actual Atlas V rocket that we put it on top of. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but we started in early 2002. And we had to launch in January of 19, uh, excuse me, of 2006. Because if we missed that three week window in January of 2006, although we could still launch later in February of 06, or even in 07, we would not be able to use a Jupiter gravity assist because Jupiter was moving out of position. So we were in a horse race to build a system that would work, but to get it launched in a very narrow window four years after we were selected. We had to hit that very narrow window in time. And as it turns out, we did. We launched on the 19th of January 2006, as I said before. But I will tell you, that set of years from 02 to 05 is a blur to me. <laughs> it was a complete blur. You know, I was traveling 40 and 50 weeks a year. I don't remember my daughter Sarah going to high school. She tells all kinds of stories that I have no recollection of. After we launched, I asked uh, my assistant at the time, Jeanette, if she would tell me, just for trivia's sake, how many plane tickets I had bought on the New Horizons project in those four years. And the answer came back 262. And it got to where my wife was calling Boulder my home away from home. Then she got to calling Maryland my home away from home. And, um, it, I think for everybody who worked on the project, it was really a labor of love because we knew we had to hit that window in time. And people said, you can't do this project that fast. And to the credit of the team and Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, this was their first outer planets mission, their first nuclear powered mission. This is a lot of firsts for, for Johns Hopkins. They got it all done and they actually made it look rather easy. And they were the new kids on the block compared to the, you know, the senior institution in planetary exploration, the Jet Propulsion Lab in Los Angeles. And um, they pulled it off and did it in a way that um, I think NASA is very proud of. Here's our spacecraft down at the Cape in November of 2005. Um, I like this picture because the thermal blankets are off and you can see some of the details below. The thermal blankets are these gold things that, that wrap the spacecraft to keep it like a cocoon or a blanket. Um, the big hair curler looking thing is a nuclear power generator called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. You fill it with plutonium, nasty stuff, and um, it generates heat because it's all cooped up, about five kilowatts worth, and using thermocouples that, that, um, that basically generate current due to a temperature differential between the cooled outer skin of the RTG and the hot interior where all that plutonium is, generate at just 6% efficiency electricity from that heat. And that's basically a nuclear battery that powers our spacecraft because we're going so far from the sun that we would need 
acres or something like that of solar cells, and they don't work at those temperatures in the outer solar system anyway. But even if they did work, there's no launch vehicle that could launch acres of solar cells. So the only way to do this is with an RTG. That requires a lot of care in getting it launched and getting the launch approved, um, being able to show that even if something goes bad, the RTG is not going to hurt anybody on the ground. Um, it completely enables outer planet exploration, though. In fact, I've renamed what RTG is. It's the really terrific generator because <laughs> it makes all this possible. Here's our entire spacecraft. You can see it's about the size of a piano. And everything we need for that 10-year journey is inside. And like Noah's Ark, we have two of most everything. right? So we have two sets of thrusters. We have two guidance computers, two command and data handling computers, two big mass memories. We have two of mostly everything except the structure, the dish antenna, and the instruments. Now, we have seven instruments, but we don't have two copies of each instrument. This is a, a map, for those of you that are more technical, of the spacecraft. And it just shows, you can see there are two big blocks here. And uh, lots of things have their twins. And it's just sort of a prop for me to use to say that we have two of mostly everything on board. So we have backup systems. Now, it turns out we're, not using, we're five years into the flight, knock on wood. We're not using any backup systems yet. We've checked them all out every year. We make sure they're still working. Um, but we're operating entirely on all of our primary systems, and they all look very healthy. We have a couple of little software bugs that catch us every now and then. Um, I, I said something on our, um, uh, our Twitter page about our computer fritzed out on us again. It's the second time this year. And somebody tweeted me back as, I wish I could get my PC to only do that twice a year. <laughs> so even though we think it's a little bit of, a, of a more than annoyance, a worry, um, really, the spacecraft's in very, very good health. Um, New Horizons carries the seven scientific instruments I mentioned earlier. They're listed here. Very briefly, we have an ultraviolet spectrometer to measure the composition and structure of Pluto's atmosphere and to search for atmospheres, um, particularly around Charon, its very large moon. We have an instrument, Alice and Ralph. These were named after the honeymooners. Ralph is our main imaging system, our color imaging system, and our ability to do um, spectroscopy to map the composition of the surfaces of these bodies. Um, we're carrying, and we're very proud of this, the first ever student-built instrument to go to the planets, built entirely by students, mentored, of course, by professors and professional engineers. Um, and it's uh, actually counting dust hits across the solar system. It's an impact detector, which will be a very, very powerful experiment when we get it in the Kuiper Belt, because it's, there's strong analogies to some of these disks we see around other planetary systems. LORI is the long-range reconnaissance imager. It's like our long focal length camera that will allow us to do a number of things, start very far out in terms of um, making news about Pluto, not just days, but months out. We'll be able to beat Hubble resolution. In addition, LORI allows us to photograph the far side of Pluto much better than we could with the Ralph camera, because although it has lots of bells and whistles for color and spectroscopy, it doesn't have the focal length that LORI has. And finally, LORI, because it's, it's nearly a spy camera being sent to Pluto, if we flew it over the Bay Area today, at the same altitude, we'll fly over Pluto and look down here. We would see this office park and count the buildings in it. And some of the very largest buildings, we could determine their shape. So it's a pretty good reconnaissance camera. SWAP and Pepsi are uh, plasma science instruments that will measure the composition and density of material flowing off Pluto's atmosphere and the standoff distance between Pluto's atmosphere and the incoming solar wind to tell us about that escape rate. And then Rex is our radio science. Um, which will be used to probe Pluto's atmosphere with radio signals sent from the deep space network on the Earth and also to measure the temperature of Pluto's surface. So as I said earlier, this is the most sophisticated set of instruments ever to fly on a reconnaissance mission, first reconnaissance mission to a new planet. Um, and that's mainly because our instruments were built in the early 2000s. And the previous first mission um, was the 1989 flyby of Neptune by Voyager built in the early 1970s. So we were a light year ahead in terms of instrumentation capability. Took advantage of that. This is how we get to Pluto quickly. Is It's really simple. You build the smallest spacecraft you can get away with, the size of a piano. You buy the biggest rocket anyone will sell you. <laughs> and then you buy an upper stage you stick on top of the rocket. This thing is 221 feet tall, 22-story downtown building called an Atlas V. And inside of it is a little hood ornament called New Horizons. So basically, you buy a really big rocket and essentially launch it empty. So the burnout speed is just unbelievable. When we left Earth orbit, 
we crossed the orbit of the moon the same day in about nine hours. That's 0.3 days. When I was a kid, Apollo missions would go to the moon 25,000 miles an hour, and it took three days. We did it in 0.3 days because this atlas gave us this amazing loft combined with this Boeing upper stage on top of it. This is um, in the final preparations. I always love this slide because when I was a kid, I made model rockets. I could never get the decal on straight, but NASA knows how. <laughs> so I was always good. This is my favorite picture of New Horizons, and it's not because I'm in it. This is actually the day that, um, that we fueled the RTG uh, inside the spacecraft. That's kind of a hazardous operation, and very quickly wanted to close the door. So I like this picture because it's the last time anybody saw New Horizons. Really, moments later, you know, they whisked me away from the PI's picture, and then they closed the door. No one has ever seen New Horizons since. Uh, this is the science team uh, down at the Cape uh, during the time of launch. Um, it really took something like this to work that hard during all those years, 02 to 05, 24-7, uh, where weekends were sort of something somebody else had. Uh, but when we got right down to it and went around the table at the Cape, everything was go. And uh, uh, we tried to launch on the 17th, I think it was the 17th of January and the 18th of January. And bad weather caught us both those days. And the next day, the 19th, we did launch. And this big 220-foot tall downtown building went supersonic in 28 seconds going vertical. I've never seen anything like it in all my life, including flying some pretty hot jet fighters. It was unbelievable to see a downtown building take off like that. And as I said, same day, we were crossing the orbit of the moon and off across the solar system, um, as I described earlier. So I'll tell you a little bit about our flight plan. We spent the first six months checking out the spacecraft, its backup systems, getting corrected on course for engine firings, learning to operate the spacecraft, which you can do some of on the ground, but really you have to be in flight, and getting all of our instruments checked out and calibrated. And then all of a sudden it dawned on us, you know what? We have to actually plan that Jupiter encounter we've been talking about forever. And we did. Now, our main objective at Jupiter was to hit the aim point that takes you to Pluto. If you don't go through that little window in space, you're going somewhere, but it isn't Pluto. So that's objective number one. And everything else had to be secondary to that. And our second objective was actually not science. It was to put the spacecraft through its paces and make sure that when we got to Pluto, we knew how to fly it and that we had calibrated all of its capabilities. We had to make sure, for example, that when we, Jupiter's on that side, the spacecraft really turned to the left. We didn't want to turn in the opposite way. Or when we try to do image motion compensation and steer with the motion, that we weren't making the problem worse, but actually making it better. And that all the instrument modes worked and the stuff we put on the recorder could really be pulled off and sent to the ground and made sense of and all those other things. And then we had an opportunity to do science. And so, um, we snuck in a little bit of science. Um, in fact, there were 700 scientific observations at Jupiter. Um, and uh, they went spectacularly well. We ended up with a cover of the journal Science in 2007. This is an actual picture of uh, Jupiter and another of its uh, moon-sized, lunar moon-sized satellite Io with a volcano going off for show at the top, right, to Vashtar, um, made by New Horizons. Actually, these two pictures were made separately um, and there's some uh, New Horizons color added to a black and white, so it's a little bit composed for the cover. But um, we got all kinds of great results, from the magnetosphere of Jupiter to its, its weather, from uh, studies of the satellites to the rings. Um, even look at this. These are vo multiple volcanoes going off on the backside of Io. There's Tavashtar up at the pole, Jupiter's rings. Just a lot of good stuff. And for being the eighth mission to Jupiter, um, uh, we still could turn up good stuff, even after the Galileo Orbiter mission that had been there for years and years. But one of the neatest things that we did, and we did it almost by accident, um, is that we ended up taking a bunch of frames of Io and that included Tavashtar here um, spewing um, a couple hundred kilometers off into space with a muzzle velocity about a kilometer per second. We took them in rapid succession and made what is the first and to the, the only movie of an extraterrestrial volcano going off. And this thing's of gargantuan scale, right? It's not like Etna spewing up 10,000 feet, right? It's going up hundreds of kilometers into space. And so I'm going to show you that movie now. It's only five frames. <laughs> <laughs> so it's what we got. But it's pretty good. Uh, I'll show it to you twice. Here, here it goes. Ready? But watch Tavashtar going off in real time. Ooh. So I'll show it backwards. 
I'll show it forwards again. That's it. Anyway, I think it's really cool. It's, it's really, really very pretty. And thank you. And then we left the Jupiter system. This is an actual not composed shot of um, two of Jupiter's large moons, again, including Tavashtar. By the way, this is real color. Um, and Jupiter at high phase. And then off we go across the solar system to Pluto. It's 2007. It's going to take till 2015. That's eight years. I remember telling myself in 2007 that's two presidential administrations. What am I going to do with myself for eight years? What are, you know, how do we keep this team together, keep practiced? How do we become good stewards of this spacecraft? You know, Voyager did a mission that was 12 years, but they had flybys every other year or every third year or something. You know, Jupiter in 79 and Saturn in 81 and then 80, 85 and 86, they were at Uranus. They had plenty of things to do along the way. Um, you know, they call it space because it's empty. We are not passing anything along the way. And so what we do is every year, and these are the years, 7, 8, 9, 10, here we are in 11, blah, blah, right? Um, our job, mostly Glenn Fountain's job and his team, is to take care of that spacecraft. Update the software when we find bugs, uh, put additional protections in the autonomy software, recalibrate the instruments, and also keep the cost down. We are operating on a very small team, just a couple dozen people. I don't think anybody on the project works full time, not a single person. Uh, I once sat next to the Voyager project manager on a, um, an airplane by accident, and I said to him, Doug, how many people did you have on Voyager? And he said, well, it depends on when. We were down to a skeleton crew at Neptune. It was about 150 people, <laughs> right? But they didn't have the computers we have today. But our little team not only has to operate this spacecraft, plan everything, conduct all the science that we do, but in addition, we have to plan our Pluto encounter. So the way we do that is something like a yin-yang process. During the summers, we actually operate the spacecraft, take it out of hibernation. The rest of the year, about nine months a year, it's mostly in hibernation. We have to do little tiny wake-ups now and then to correct the antenna pointing or something. But mostly because the spacecraft is sleeping, the operations team can go work on planning the encounter. And that's what we've been doing. We're very, very far along in that. In fact, next year, in 2012, up on the spacecraft, we will conduct our first rehearsal of that encounter, partial rehearsal, a full rehearsal the year after in 2013. Whoops. OK, so we are now deep in cruise. We're starting to feel like we can see a light at the end of the tunnel. We are really looking forward to 2015. Four years ago, we were just pulling up to Jupiter. Four years from now, we'll be just pulling up to Pluto. Um, a lot of people think, you know, you did all this for like a weekend at Pluto when you're really close. But we are going to start in January and then end in July. It's six months of encounter science. Now, admittedly, the best stuff is the closest approach. Um, but we begin our formal encounter operations in April. Our closest approach is on July 14th. Uh, it's Bastille Day, so it's easy to remember. Uh, storm the gates of the Kuiper Belt. Um, and then uh, continue to take science for a few weeks on the way out. We'll fire our engines to go off to Kuiper Belt objects. Um, and we'll be transmitting data from these very large solid state memories down to the ground for months. Um, this is a sort of a map of what we call approach phase one, two, and three, near encounter phase and departure phases one, two, and three. And we are architecting all of those and uh, writing the sequences for them on our cruise to Pluto with this very small team, and then practicing those on the spacecraft ground simulator that lets us um, actually run through all the sequences and test how they work. And we start in the middle with near encounter phase, which is most important, and then what we call core encounter just around it. And now we finish that, and we're working on approach phase three and departure phase one. And then as we move outward to less intense phases, we'll be getting closer to Pluto. In fact, we'll plan approach phase one and the last departure stuff actually almost in real time, the way that we plan normal operations when we're cruising. But we'll get all the hard parts done before we get to Pluto. And we'll rehearse those, not just on the ground simulator, but up on the spacecraft. Um, when we get to Pluto, it gets busy. And I'm not going to walk through this. But it gives you some indication at top level of the number of things that are going on in the last few weeks between optical navigation, course corrections, emptying, flushing our solid state memory so that it's completely empty and we can fill it up with Pluto data, um, early observations on approach, lots of spacecraft maintenance, instrument checkout activities. It's going to be a very busy time. Now, Pluto, you may not know this, like the planet Uranus, is tipped on its side. So when we approach it, we approach it like a bullseye on this, this red line trajectory here and here. We're coming from the direction of the sun, and we're going to sort of pierce that bullseye and fly outward into the Kuiper Belt. 
Uh, and you can see the orbits of um, Hydra and Nix and Charon down there for orientation. And it, this is the inner part of that um, trajectory, just a couple of hours around closest approach, which occurs around noon Greenwich Mean Time on the 14th of July in 2015. And we're actually aiming not just to hit a certain place so that we get all the good imagery and spectroscopy that we want, but also we intend to fly through the shadows of Pluto and Charon so we can watch the Earth and the Sun rise and set, not for PR, but for scientific purposes because we'll use the light from the Sun and radio signals sent from the Deep Space Network on the Earth to probe Pluto's atmosphere. To do that, we have to fly through those very narrow shadows. And that's the trick, that's the navigator's trick on this mission, okay? When we get it really in, this is our flight plan, what it looks like in even the next level of detail. Every one of these things that looks like a little battery is a separate observation color-coded by instrument. So the orange ones are the Ralph instrument and the blue ones are the Alice instrument and the green ones are something else and the yellow ones are something else again. The red ones are yet another instrument, right? And you can just, I don't want you to do anything except just get the feeling that in the last few hours, the number of different things that we'll be doing take different kinds of maps, different kinds of spectra, thermal measurements of Pluto, its three moons, search for other moons. It's going to be very, very busy, very jam-packed. We have filled not only the solid state recorders, we can calculate how much data from every observation. We're filling them almost to the brim, just leaving a little bit of room for error. But we're also filling the command memory. There's only so many commands you can put in the spacecraft buffer. We're filling that up as well to get as much done in this very precious nine days of closest approach right around Pluto. Yes? Alice Best. What is Alice Best? That's the best resolution measurement by the Alice instrument, which is almost blind. So it doesn't make a very good best. Uh -huh. um, but these are the sorts of revolutionary things that we will do. Um, first, as I said, it's not a weekend. It's six months of encounter science. We will exceed Hubble resolution for 20 weeks, 10 weeks on the way in and 10 weeks on the way out mapping Pluto and all three of its satellites and any others that we find, making those surface composition maps. At Pluto alone, we'll have over a million places where we know the composition on the disk of the planet. We'll measure the temperature at very many places on the surface, so we can correlate that with composition and geology. We'll directly measure the escape rate of the atmosphere, the atmospheric temperature pressure structure, and the composition of the atmosphere, right down to trace constituents at the 1% level. We'll know if Pluto and or Sharon differentiated, whether Sharon has a substantial atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, as planetary scientists, what we most look forward to is being surprised, right? Whole new class of planet. And every time we send a spacecraft to a new class of planet, we've been surprised because no one expected Venus to be the hell that it is or Mercury to be mostly core. Who ordered that? Or Mars to have river channels or Io to have volcanoes. Everywhere we went, we were surprised. So we're most looking forward to what the, the dwarf planets have to teach us new about planetary science. Um, to give you one example of how well we will do, this is, I'm sorry, this is the best Hubble image of Pluto ever made. You can't tell much, can you, right? Maybe there are polar caps up at the top, okay? And next to it is a Hubble image, same camera, made of another object, Triton, which is the same size as Pluto. It orbits Neptune. It used to be a big Kuiper Belt dwarf planet, but Neptune captured it into orbit. This is what it really looks like from Voyager. This is the best Hubble can do. So you can imagine how much better than this one could do if you sent Voyager to Pluto. But with New Horizons, we can take little spots that Voyager could hardly see inside and do that. We get down our very best imagery to 75 meters per pixel. Now we can't do that everywhere. We don't have enough time but we will map it very, very well all the way across the disk of the planet. And even on the far side, it will have imagery that it's about as good as if you take your home binoculars out and go look at the moon. So we'll have the basic geological pattern and composition and temperatures um, everywhere across the planet and its moons. And then we go off into the Kuiper belt after that. Um, NASA likes to brag about firsts. There are a lot of firsts in New Horizons, not just being first to Pluto, the first planetary mission launched since 1977. In fact, by the time we get there in 2015, half the Americans, half the people in this country, will not have been alive at the Voyager encounter uh, with its last planet, Neptune. So this will be all new. Like to my kids, they were all born 
um, since that time. Um, first mission to explore a double planet, an ice dwarf, first the Kuiper Belt, lots and lots. You can read it for yourself. Like I said, it's a little bit larger than life for those of us that are involved. And it really is about a team. This is the science and core engineering team, but as I said, hundreds, and in fact, counting the launch vehicle, thousands of people were involved in building it. And a number of those people are in the audience today. If I could ask the people involved in New Horizons to just stand up and the rest of you to thank them, I would really appreciate it. Could they stand up? Cindy, stand up. You've got to really want it on this mission. Some of us started in 1989, and we're still not there. It's a career to go this far in the solar system. So we're back to ground down pencils, right? We're not there yet. We still have to take care of this thing for four more years and get it right. Um, every now and then we get a little bit of a scare. Uh, my cell phone rings on the wrong day, and it's Glenn Fountain in a very deep voice. Um, but I want to tell you something else. I said we didn't get this um, b just because we hadn't been there, and that little stamp that said we hadn't been there. After we fly by Pluto, one thing we intend to do is make sure that the post office does print a stamp that actually shows New Horizons went to Pluto. So with that, I will say thanks. I really appreciate your attention tonight and the opportunity to come here. Time for uh, questions? Yes. I'm going to use my prerogative here, Alan. Uh, the Beyond Pluto... Uh, is there an active search for other targets for New Horizons? Yes. yes. Uh, the Kuiper Belt objects that we're going to, we're just starting the search for this year. We're using the largest telescopes on the Earth, like the Keck. Um, the searches will start this summer. You might ask why we didn't search previously. Remember that hole in the Kuiper Belt I showed you? said nobody looks there. That's actually the direction that Pluto is. And so we've been, you know, if, if any of you are amateur astronomers, you know what the star fields of Sagittarius are like. We had to wait until our Kuiper Belt Zone cleared all that confusion, that background stuff, and that happened in 2011. So we've already got the telescope time. We have four teams, and they'll begin the search for our KBOs this summer. I hope that by this time next year, we've got them in the bag. We'll have several candidates, and we'll pick from them the best to fly to. So we're going to alternate. You take the first one over here, and I'll take one over here. Okay. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you're really hoping to find some surprises at Pluto. Will you be able to react to surprises and change your programming of your thing, uh, or you're going too fast and it's too far away to do that? Right. We will not be able to react to surprises by changing our program. And in fact, although technically we could do that, we've chosen um, uh, not to get greedy and take a well-rehearsed and practiced plan that we put on a shelf and then maybe by trying to make it a little bit better, make a big mistake. Now, on the ground, there'll be plenty of reaction from those surprises. And we've thought about the kinds of things that might surprise us and therefore um, plan second and third looks at some places and um, uh, some types of observations, make them multiply or make time-lapse movies, for example, to look for changes like the volcanoes on Io. We, we try to think through some of that, but unfortunately, we don't have a second spacecraft, so it's our one look. And that's just the nature of it. It's better to let um, uh, good enough triumph over trying to do your best because sometimes you can actually stub your toe that way. Thank you for that question. Alan, thank you very much. I, um, I'm struck that the need for delayed gratification on this project is really extreme. <laughs> and so clearly there might be some survivorship bias in terms of who's on the project t today. Yeah. Uh, but could you speak more to, you know, how, how you've looked at the psychology of, of the, the team members and how it's been so important to focus on some, a payoff way down the road? Yeah, well, I will say um, no one has quit. It's quite a project to be a part of. Um, and um, it, it's, it's, it's also inspirational for people. So um, people who get involved in this know what the stakes are and they know how, what a time commitment it is. Um, we have really not had the problem of people sort of flaking off on us. Um, and I think that may be a selection effect ba based on being in the space business. In fact, when I talk to my neighbors, you know, uh, one of them is a car salesman, for example. You know, and his horizon is always this month or this quarter. But in the space business, you know, any space mission 
takes years to develop and uh, years to carry out generally. And so people in this business are used to these longer time scales. And uh, we just haven't had that problem. But um, the, the, the place where I think the most persistence was required was getting canceled over and over and never getting out of the paper stage and people coming at, back at it again and again just to get the thing started. But once we got it started, it was much easier. It was very real to really be a part of a big enterprise like that. Um, I, I know you're expecting to be surprised, but if you had to pick one of the imaged moons uh, or planets to, uh, as a guess as what, what it might look like, w could, could you take a guess or do you guys have a pool or <laughs> anything like that? We actually had a pool of um, guesses made in 1993, long before we ever got New Horizons approved. Um, we had a scientific workshop in Flagstaff, Arizona. All the world's Kuiper Belt and Pluto experts came, or almost all. And at the end, we, we let people write their predictions, and we put them all in an envelope, which is still sealed to this day. <laughs> right, there are about 90 predictions. Um, um, but I reveal mine, so, I, uh, so I'll, I'll reveal it to you now. Because I asked a lot of people at dinner that night, and I heard things like, oh, you know, the, uh, the methane mixing ratio is really going to be higher than the carbon monoxide mixing ratio. That's what I put down. You know, um, and very detailed predictions like that. Um, but I, uh, at the time, was reminded of just what, how floored we were at these discoveries, like I mentioned, like, you know, river valleys on Mars or volcanoes on Io. And so my prediction is still sealed in that envelope. And um, if you open it, it, I'm the only one that's guaranteed to be right. <laughs> because when you open it, it just says two words. That what we'll find is, is this, something wonderful. <laughs> Uh, yes, so my question is, have you ever thought of attempting to orbit Pluto, and how hard would that be? Um, thought about it. Um, uh, it. You know that big 225, 22-foot tall rocket that got us going? In order to stop, I'd need another. <laughs> strapped to New Horizons right now. Um, and even if I could stop, then I wouldn't be able to go on to the Kuiper Belt. So this is a flyby mission. Like all the first missions to the planets, we always do flybys before orbiters. I don't know how old you are, but I think the orbiter mission, you should be PI, right? <laughs> and I'll be watching from the sidelines. And, and also, how long will the, the New Horizons continue to report after the Kuiper Belt? Or so we'll do the Kuiper Belt mission. It lasts about six years if we get approved to do that. And I'm pretty sure you know, NASA won't want to just say, forget that Kuiper Belt mission after we got a spacecraft all the way out there. But we could go on beyond the Kuiper Belt. There won't be any planets or even uh, objects that we know of to fly by. Um, but there is some valuable things like the Voyager mission is doing now in terms of exploring the outer heliosphere. And I used to say that it, that just wasn't my job. My job was to run the thing out of fuel in the Kuiper Belt, doing the best job we could. But lately, we've come to realize that we could probably run a 30-year mission after the Kuiper Belt on the very last kilogram of fuel. So my knees are weakening. And I'm, Pretty sure we're going to give them one kilogram of fuel, and they can go on into the 2050s um, exploring the heliosphere. That's what we'll probably do, but that would be a second extended mission. Alan, since you got the RTG working for yeah. this mission, have you now got RTGs set up? I mean, did you break down all of the resistance, and are we going to be able to use them in the future? Um, boy, that's a big question, Jill. First of all, we found that there wasn't very much resistance. Unlike um, in the 90s and 80s, I think people are more accepting. Um, and NASA has a very good process for ensuring the safety of it. Um, Glenn and I could tell you war stories about how involved it was. And I forget, it was something like 20 federal agencies got involved, state and local. It was very, very involved to get the approval to launch. Um, uh, really, um, that is a, that's a very difficult process even to go forward in the future, but it's a tractable process. And we proved it. We did it. In half the time, Cassini did the paperwork. It took them eight years. It took us four. Um, the problem now is we're running out of that plutonium, and we need to restart the plutonium production lines. In fact, half the plutonium atoms on New Horizons are colored red because they're from Russia. Um, <laughs> the other half are blue. <laughs> and, and actually, um, uh, we signed a contract with the Russians many years ago, we NASA, and have been buying Russian surplus plutonium. But that contract's almost over. We're almost out. Very little U.S. reserves left. And so there's been a big controversy about whether NASA or the Department of Energy is going to pay for restarting those production lines. And because both agencies have a lot of budget pressures, they've been fighting about that for years. And hopefully it'll get resolved very 
soon because otherwise we don't really have a way to do outer planets missions. Does the New Horizons have the ability to make any decisions on its own, either or, or multiple choice kind of decisions? Yes, it, uh, the New Horizons spacecraft um, has a system, a software system on board that runs on the computer that looks at a lot of the telemetry signals, temperatures, pressures, voltages, what's going on in the computer, and can detect some, about a hundred different known fault conditions that the engineers have thought about, like we're leaking fuel or like the computer just rebooted. And uh, then on detecting one of those, it can follow a checklist. And it needs to be able to operate on its own because even though we have human operators, if we, if we were there on the ground, we wouldn't know about it for hours because of the finite speed of light. And even if we knew what to do about it, instantaneously it would take hours more to get the fix up there and it could be too late. So the spacecraft has this autonomy system that can do that. But what the spacecraft doesn't have is a system to look at scientific data and say, ooh, I want an extra picture of that. Okay? We just plan those out in advance um, as um, an experienced scientific team and hope that we've done the best possible job. Uh, question. Qu one, one very short suggestion. Perhaps you might want to make that a, a forever stamp. <laughs> there you go. Okay. In, in, I in, like that. In the spirit of, of your mission. Uh, so, Scientific question, uh, with respect to, to sort of planetary objects, particularly uh, solar planetary objects, sort of we started off in the classical period with a handful and uh, made observations with respect to that handful. Now it seems as though we're, we're transitioning into a, a statistical phase, potentially, mm -hmm. uh, with, with perhaps the gulf of, of a couple handfuls where we, we have, we can't really go statistical yet, but we have mm -hmm. some, some good hypotheses and we'll, uh, Will, will New Horizons make a contribution to definitely putting us into the statistical uh, realm well, of looking at these things? We won't be detecting new objects in the Kuiper Belt uh, unless we detect moons of either Pluto or our Kuiper Belt flybys. But I think when people really see the data sets, when you really see the objects, um, they'll have very good appreciation for the complexity of this third zone of the solar system. And um, I think that will be uh, almost visceral. Right now, they're just points of light, right? You just have to take our word for it. They're really planets. They really have weather and things that we can only just barely tell. But wait till you see the imagery. Yeah. Sorry. Alan, thank you so much for visiting us uh, this evening and giving us information on this fascinating uh, mission, which is a very important one. Two questions uh, tonight. Number one, you mentioned that uh, you were using state-of-the-art equipment when New Horizons was being built. I'm just curious, number one, if you, with the technological advances that we have since New Horizons was built, is there any instrumentation that you wish you would have had aboard uh, the spacecraft? And number two, what provisions have been made against perhaps solar winds or radiation that might provide some kind of disruption of uh, proper operation of the uh, spacecraft? Those are both good questions. Even at the time we were building them, there were instruments we wish we could have included just because we would know more. Um, but I was determined, and I think that the, there wasn't any blowback from the team. We knew that because there had been five cancellations that have gotten out of control on cost, that we, it was better to have 80% of something than 100% of absolutely nothing and overreach. Um, and so we did have scientific instruments that we would have preferred to carry, like magnetometers, uh, like uh, some longer wavelength infrared uh, and thermal instruments, things like that. Um, but they were just really, this was quite a stretch already to carry the instrumentation that we did. And in fact, when we first wrote the proposal and planned the project, some of the instruments were called core and some were called supplementary. And the supplementary was code word for you walk the plank if we get into money troubles. Fortunately, nobody had to walk the plank. Um, this instrument, Pepsi, we did threaten to de-scope, and we told them, if you don't do it right, you're going to be diet Pepsi. But that <laughs> never happened. Um, as far as radiation, um, the spacecraft is built to take a lot more radiation than it'll ever see. And it's also those gold mylar um, uh, thermal blankets have Kevlar lacing in them to protect the spacecraft against micrometeoroids. So that's all been thought through by the engineering team. Yes, sir. Yeah, earlier in your slide, Joe, you, sh you showed some objects, and you mentioned uh, Kuiper Belt as well as the Oort Cloud. How does the Oort Cloud figure into this? Okay. Um, so the Oort Cloud is, is a little astronomy 101. The Oort Cloud is a region far beyond the Kuiper Belt um, where um, uh, the detritus of solar system formation, the shards left over from the formation of the planet, were ejected by the giant planets as they cleaned up 
the giant planet zone as objects would make flybys, not collide with Jupiter, or Saturn, or Uranus, or Neptune, but get slung out. Most of them got slung out of the solar system altogether. They go up the lip of the gravitational potential well and out of the solar system. But some objects just get stuck up on the, on the lip, if you will. And that's called the Oort cloud. It's a thousand times farther away than Pluto. So we're going there, but none of us will ever live to see it, and the spacecraft won't be operating. It'll just be a derelict when it gets there. It's really um, quite a gargantuan scale. And to impress you further, in Maine, there's, there's a um, scale model of the solar system with a mile per astronomical unit. The sun is 150 feet across in downtown Presque Isle, Maine. And the Earth, you know, is this big a mile away. And Pluto is this big 40 miles away. And I was asked when I gave a talk there how far away um, the uh, Oort cloud is. And the correct answer is in South America. Right? Everything else fits in one county. Uh, to get a sense of the sense To get a sense of the sensitivity of your instrument, uh, since Pluto is so far away from the sun, yeah. uh, you have an integration time necessary to take any image. Can you give a sense of uh, how sensitive the instruments have to be and what kind of integration times you have to accomplish in order to get data? Yeah. So at Pluto, being 32 times as far from the sun as the Earth is, the light levels are 32 squared or about 1,000 times lower. And that just sounds terrible. Um, but you notice all of our instruments are pretty small. And all of our integration times are pretty fast. They're fractions of a second, typically 100 milliseconds or something. Right? So people always think it's dark. But actually, the sunlight at Pluto is um, several times the brightness of the full moon. And if you've ever been on a camp out and read a book by the full moon, you know it's not so bad. And we have lots of cameras on the Earth that you can buy at, at Radio Shack and at, at Best Buy that will operate at those light levels. So really, um, maybe popular mechanics wants it to sound heroic, but these aren't, the light levels aren't that bad. They're like at dusk. And, and our instruments are built to deal with that, in fact, to operate all the way across the Kuiper Belt where it's even dimmer. But it's not so dim. It's not like being in a pitch dark room. Uh, considering the... Over here. Yeah, there Considering you are. the uh, extreme distances that you're transmitting from, uh, what kind of data link speed do you have for the uh, data coming back from the spacecraft, and how long do you expect it to take to get all that data back here in, on Earth? Right. So um, we made some compromises in order to make the mission affordable and doable, and one of them was to have a relatively low data rate. Um, uh, we will transmit our very best data rates from the far side of the solar system, from Pluto, um, very best we'll ever hit is about 3,000 bits per second, and you would never read your email at that bit rate. It would drive you crazy, okay? Um, that's still 100 times faster than the first missions to Mars, you know, operating at much closer range, but um, very slow compared to modern-day data rates from spacecraft, which can be megabits or even gigabits per second from the moon, for example. So it will take us months. And our entire philosophy is we take data like a fire hose while we're there, and then we spool it back to the ground over months. And so, again, there's going to be a lot of delayed gratification because the imagery is all going to be on the spacecraft in July, but you won't be seeing a lot of it on the ground until August, September, October, November. Is it X-band? It is X-band, and there's a, um, there are other frequencies we use as well. I know you've uh, said that uh, you're looking forward to the surprise. But the question I have, is there one question, one burning question you have about the Kuiper belt that you're looking forward to an answer, either yay or nay, or I never expected that? Uh, my, own, my own question would be how active these objects are on their surfaces and in their interiors. For example, the question of whether Pluto has an ocean in its interior and whether it might have volcanoes or geysers going off or even, as some people um, postulate, um, pools or rivers of um, cryogenic liquids. So, uh, Alan, I, I have to tell the audience, uh, first of all, that when I first met Alan, um, I was a young junior uh, faculty at the University of Colorado, and he was a graduate student. I had spent um, well over a decade studying the giant objects of the solar system. Jupiter's magnetic field was my area of speciality. 
and I was particularly interested in exploring, you know, the big planets with the big magnetic fields. Along comes this graduate student who says, why not study Pluto? And I'm thinking, why? It doesn't have a magnetic field, it's a tiny little object, it's at the farthest distance of the solar system, why bother? He kept at it and persuaded me that it was worth joining him on this venture, and it's been a great adventure. Uh, and, you know, the thing that's most impressive about him giving this talk, he gives this enormous amount of credit to the people around him who've done a fair amount of work, but he's the guy who has the persistence and has made the mission happen. So uh, he deserves a lot more credit than he uh, gives himself. But I have a question. Good. <laughs> now that we are past that part. <laughs> Not quite a Buzz Aldrin, but... Uh, um, so, uh, what do you think is the, pl the most exciting, important place to go in the solar system to do planetary science um, other than Pluto? What's the next step? What's the next big challenge? Yeah, so I used to be in a position to actually make that happen. And I do think that the bell of the ball, the most important place w where you can make the biggest difference, make an investment, is at um, uh, this very large moon of Saturn called Titan which I think has the most revolutionary things to teach us both about um, the physics and chemistry of active planetary bodies as well as about astrobiology. And I hope that NASA spends a whale of a lot of money on a flagship mission to Titan in my lifetime. Thanks, Fran. So what science are you planning on doing on the two small moons of uh, Pluto? Right. Okay, so good question. So, so Nix and Hydra, um, which are probably the size of like counties, not worlds, um, and which were only discovered in 2005 by the Hubble Space Telescope, um, got added to our plan kind of late. Uh, we will be able to map them at the same resolution as Pluto. Now, we'll have less pixels on them because they're smaller amounts of terrain, but the same resolution. Um, we'll see them in color at the same resolution that we will see Pluto in color. We will see their surface compositions with a few pixels across each object so we can look to see if they have differences place to place. On one of them, we will uh, be able to get a sense of its surface temperature, direct sense, not just something we can calculate from its brightness and where it orbits in the solar system. Um, and uh, we will look for dust structures around them and do a few other things. Um, that's pretty much our laundry list at Nix and Hydra. We'll also measure their rotation rates and um, get a better handle on their masses from their orbits. More questions? Actually, we're going to uh, cut off the questions, but you're all very welcome to come up <laughs> and talk to uh, Alan. Uh, and Alan, as a memento of your uh, talk to here tonight, uh, we have a uh, special Drake equation uh, double, oh, oh. double system for you, plus a, uh, a SETI pin. Thank um, you very much, Adrian. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Chardonnay and equations. <laughs> what could be better? Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks for coming this evening. Thanks for inviting me. And um, see you in 2015. Stay tuned. Uh, we're going to blow your doors off. <laughs> and if you can't wait till 2015, remember we've got another talk next month. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike Ahern is going to come and talk to us about the stunning photos they've got back from Epoxy on February 17th. Uh, so uh, we'll see you back then. Thanks again. Thanks very much, everybody. Okay.